Hello and welcome to episode two of Peak. I'm joined by oh, I Will Dominate. And the theme of the show and the theme of Peak as like a series is the idea of contradicting this well-balanced versus imbalanced life uh, mantra that you hear where everybody has to have uh, kind of like a well-balanced eight to five, you know, weekends free, et cetera, et cetera. And that it's somehow unhealthy or wrong to do one thing for 14 hours a day, sleep and wake up the next day and do it again for three or four months, which contradicts a lot of things that we see in, in high performance uh, science, such as things like flow state and elite performance and the mastery of a craft, which are which are things that are very beneficial and interesting for humans to do, and which usually accelerate them, you would say, beyond the average in other things that they undertake after they master a craft or a skill. And so Peak is, is a series designed to like uncover this idea of what it looks like to all in on something in terms of an un- imbalanced life and what skills you and transferable skills you get from that practice that you can bring elsewhere and also to uncover performance frameworks because I've worked with over a hundred professional players now and to a T all of them who've reached the elite level have had a performance framework that got them there. And it's been very interesting to kind of discover those on my own. And so I've been looking for other elite performers to kind of like do it in public and share with you and I will dominate has agreed to join me today. So thank you. Yep. And welcome. Sounds good. Yeah, I'm excited. I want to see if I actually am the first out of the hundred players that you've worked with that does not have a <laughs> performance framework. Yeah, that's so gonna we'll that's see. gonna be it. It's like I don't know, man. <laughs> okay. I just like uh logged into the game. Like, and... Nah, I just yeah, I just smoked hella weed and just didn't play, you know. I don't know. I don't know what happened. How did I get here? I think everybody's gonna tell me after this comment to to do uh, forgiven, you know. Um, cause the, everybody's yeah. talking about how he just like goes to Greece and like sits on a beach for <laughs> six months and then logs in and he's the best, you know, 80 carry in the West or whatever. Um, shoot. I lost my internet for a second there. Uh, okay. I thought that was me for a sec. Nope. Probably my kids just found their iPads next door and, uh, jumped on the Wi-Fi. Dear God. Nice. <clears throat> All right. So, um, let's kick it off. Usually the first question I start with is um, I'm trying to define where the mental shift occurred between when you were playing video games for entertainment purposes and when you realized that you were training a craft or training a sport or training in some way. So when was the moment when you were like kind of just like playing video games, when it shifted for you mentally, I mean mentally your identity, where you were like, okay, I'm not doing this. I can tell you. Ex- yeah. I can tell you exactly Everybody when. Everybody can. I can tell you exactly when. And so, um. When I was 15, I started playing, or when I was 14, I started playing Dota. Um, and back then, like, there was, like, a, a chat room. It was, like, a chat room, but it had a bot in it, and it was a network called TDA, which is called Team Dota All-Stars. And it was just, like, random games. It was, like, public games that you would join. But um, these were actually filtered, like, before you'd have people leaving and whatever. But in TDA, that was the first um, group where you'd actually get filtered out if you, like, left games, if you were, like, ridiculously toxic, whatever, they would actually kick you out. Um, and... You know, we I played that for for a while, and then eventually I started playing um, this league called the In-House League, which was the first competitive um, in-house Dota league in the world. And this was in 2015, and or, sorry, not 2015, 2005. Sorry, <laughs> and it was um, ran by Ucross, who is a uh, who was actually just a dentist. He was just a, a dentist that also had a, a background in programming, and he had this amazing bot and this this great system. This guy was actually a genius. He had a, a great bot, great system. It was the most well moderated thing that I've ever seen um, to this day. And he, and it, and it had a ranked letter and everything. So this was the first time wow. you could actually be a, uh, like you could, you had a ranked system and all the best thousand Dota players um, in North America were like invited to this league. Um, and yeah, you'd queue up th- for a game through the bot and it would like assort teams based on MMR. It literally was like riots, whole matchmaking, but in a like text bot in, in, in a like channel an IRC Warcraft. Channel. Yeah, so... Um, oh, in you know, the Warcraft client. In, in the Warcraft got client. Got it, got it. So it was a bot, like, in, in, the, in, in the, the... Right, right, I remember yeah. these rooms. Okay, And eventually they, they, they moved um, to a, a IRC. To there was something called IH, yeah, an IHCS, and it was an, um, an, an IRC channel that had uh, a fusion between Europeans and North Americans because that became, like... They, there became a way that you could play um, on lower ping through, like, Arena or whatever. Um, and you were able to actually play versus Europeans, um, with reasonable ping. So that was like a huge deal when that came out. But, um, yeah, essentially when I joined this league, I didn't really get vouched because I was very good. I was just like part of a group of like internet friends and they were good. So I got vouched in because 
one of the people I was friends with was like one of the best players um, in North America at that time. And when I joined the league, I was super bad. There was like a thousand, um, like 1,038 spots in the entire league. And I was like rank a thousand, you know, I was like one of the absolute worst players in the league. And I just been playing less time. What, than, what position than people. were you playing by the way? Do you remember? I play, I played everything, but I, I eventually became hero? a carry. My favorite. I mean, I, I like Dota. The I way it worked back then is everyone, I, everyone played everything. Yeah. The things that I was best at eventually w- was actually jungling because jungling in Dota was more complex. Like mm, yeah. people didn't understand pulling like that. All, all the, the things that are so standard now in Dota were like mind blowing, like groundbreaking ideas that came through. Like when when it became like, like you pulling. could pull the, the yeah pulling the creeps to the jungle camps and then like uh, champions like Beastmaster or like Chen, you'd eat tank, you'd like eat the trees and then you'd pull like one wave from camp. So there was a skill involved with jungling, and not that many people would you know, get down all the timings. Like it was something that took a lot of practice to really perfect. And even back then the aggro was like a little buggy. Sometimes things would de-aggro for no reason. Like it was just not a a perfect um, thing. So yeah, like I I ended up playing, playing jungle for like teams and stuff like that, but I could really play everything. It was actually funny because over my career I became just like in Dota, I was like a carry player at the beginning. Like I would, I would be like the person sitting in the side lane, like farming, playing like Spectre or something like that. And then eventually join the team fight and try to one V five. Like that was my role. Um, because back then I was considered to have good mechanics. And then as I got older, I became more like a jungler. And then even as I progressed through league of legends at the beginning, I was like a mechanical player and I became more of a, uh, like more of like a cerebral player. Yeah. Later on in my career. But when I was 15, there was a point where I started, like, I really just, back then like shit talk was brutal you know like people would be like i was i was like 14 or 15 and I, I, my voice anything. was still super high yeah yeah people would so everyone was just like oh you what are you like some little faggot like all this shit like they're just they would just go in on you like is that a girl like all this shit you know like just the worst shit like you like kill yourself you little like piece of shit like it was just it was so it was like, like when the, xbox the when xbox live came out and all of a sudden yeah, all the halo was, players could could like yeah, talk it was to each insane. other it was like nuts. yeah people, like, n-words Completely flying all unmodern. over like yeah, it was it was it was crazy. Um, and even though there was like some toxicity moderation, it, it wasn't like, yeah, it, it wasn't anything like riots toxicity moderation, which is like pretty strict by the standards that um, were set a long time ago yeah. in, in online gaming. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to be like really good to just beat all these players. And I remember just like starting grinding, and I was just I wanted to be rank one so fucking bad in this in this league on on this just bot. Like it wasn't even. You didn't get anything if you were ranked How, one. So it wasn't like it was. Tor- what is the first thing that you modified? Like when you hit that moment and you were like, "Okay, I want to get rank one." I assume that you like you stopped giving in to certain like practices or tendencies or habits or whatever that you had, and you started doing like something else. So you started like you stopped like giving into a certain emotion and you started doing something else. Like what? What was the? What was the? Sh- um, what was the shift in behavior that your shift in identity actually triggered? Like that kicked off the climb. For me, I think the main thing was just being like super, super like self-critical of like everything mm-hmm. and just being like um, really analytical about what champions actually could do, like try to figure out like different combos, like try to understand the metagame, like literally everything that I could think of, I would try to improve on. I'm like, okay, this person's better than me in mechanics. Like, how do I become me- mechanically better? What do I do? Like, how does he combo? Like, how does he line up his spells? Like, how does he angle his skill shots? When does he throw them? Things like that. Things that are pretty obvious in League now. Like, in Dota, that, that was the first game like that. So, people have to figure all that stuff so what, out. So, like, what I see is, like, this shift where, like, you essentially are saying, like, you 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 allow yourself to criticize your own skill set and don't assume that you are, like, good at something. Yeah, no, I, I, I knew I was, was really bad. But I just, like, like, back then, I mean, it was just on the rank letter. I just knew statistically I was really bad. But, um... Yeah, to to get better, I like it, it, there was so many different avenues to get better that I just tried to get better at like literally yeah, everything. Right, yeah. So I would. So you had a like, ladder, like you had a ladder to like basically say like that you were trash. You didn't have to. You didn't have to yeah. like mentally yeah. go yeah. there. Okay. Yeah, but but it was okay for me because I knew that I'd played less time than the other people, so I didn't feel like super bad about it. I wasn't like, damn, I'm like just like stupid or something. I'm like, yeah, well, all these people have played so much more than me. I've been playing like three or four months. Of course, I'm not going to be. You were like, like as I'm good relatively as good compared to the time investment. Yeah, for the, I, I felt so like, could, yeah, that, that's that's exactly you could how hold it was. that I cockiness like I was, there as your ambition. Yeah, and and also just I don't know, like growing up. I mean, I think I had good parenting. I had like decently high self esteem, so I was like, oh, you can be like good at anything you put your mind to, type thing. Okay. Like I actually believed that, right? So I was like, okay, I'm gonna put my mind to this, and I actually want to be super good. So I mean, I I would like pretend I was sick, take days off school, like do anything to just play as many games as possible. And 
yeah, I mean, when I when I did hit rank one, I had the most games played out of everyone in the league too. So like I was just, and and I was going to school like I was a high school kid. So I was really. And you actually went to college, so you must not have failed out of high school or anything. I mean, no, I mean, I I didn't I didn't have like terrible grades. Like I had like a like a B average in in high school, okay. but I was good at music, so I was able to get into like a pretty good college just mm-hmm. based off like musical talent yeah, rather than uh, clarinet and saxophone. Okay, so awesome. I played. I played classical clarinet and I played saxophone for jazz okay. bands and things like that. And I guess something that was useful was like in in um, like jazz bands, there are pieces that do incorporate clarinet, but a clarinet isn't like a standard instrument within a jazz band. Absolutely. So sometimes like like there's um yeah there's a bunch of uh, pieces where there would be a clarinet solo, but you like they would have to just you know have somebody play it on soprano sax or something that wasn't quite right. So I think that that was one of my advantages since I did play two inter- oh. instruments i could like fall back to the clarinet i could do like a clarinet solo um which i guess jazz teachers really liked abusing so you could you could like earn a chair in a jazz band that like with that asset basically they'd say like okay well we want the guy at least who can yeah. pull out the clarinet for this whole awesome yeah yeah so it was, it was good um so that's how, that's pretty much how i got into college like i didn't have the, the grade requirement to get to uni- get into university of miami at the time was 3.5 i had like a 2.9 so I did not have a very high GPA. I had like B minus average. Well, those things or whatever, are suggestions but. anyway. I mean, I didn't meet <laughs> I didn't meet my university one either. Um, but uh, yeah, but I had pretty good SAT yeah, score stuff, and yeah. just played music. So yeah. All right. So that was that was the moment. The next question I ask usually refers to trying to understand your support structure, and this is going to be a little different for you because you're not a pro right now. So I'm curious both. <laughs> What is your support structure now as an entertainment business performer? So you're a performer, right? But you're a performer in terms of entertainment and business. And you have to have high performance in business to succeed in business. That's true. Um, but it's not a zero-sum game like competing where like there's a winner and a loser, period. Yeah. Like everybody in business can make money. There's kind of enough of it to go around at some point. Um, mm-hmm. And then I want to talk about what it looked like when you were competing. Maybe we, we can do that first. But let me explain, first of all, the kind of three pillars I'm going to look for. Uh and this isn't based on any science or anything. It's based more on my experience of, of other people and understanding elite performance. But basically, I'm looking for three things. Number one, describe to me your relationship with your peer group. So as a like journey partners, the people who are like in it with you. And, and these are the people that have you have very short-term relationships with this. Because when you go to another team or you go to somebody else or you go to like a different group or whatever, you kind of like leave them behind and you join new ones. So how did you see your, or, and how motivating and supportive and, and how did you relate with your journey partners as you were going along? And then the second one is your cheerleaders. So these are people who like you, regardless of whether you win or lose, right? They like, they like, uh, shoot, is it Christian or Christian? Mm-hmm. Or like what, what, uh, Christian. Christian. Okay. I did say your name right. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. I always try to check that before, mm-hmm. before the, uh, mm-hmm. the, uh, <laughs> sessions. But anyway, the people who like Christian, like, and have nothing to do with anything mm-hmm. else, right? And whether you win or you lose, like, they're going to like you, period. Um, so they're like your cheerleaders. And usually that's family members. It can be other people too. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. mentors. So these are people who, they don't necessarily have to have walked the same path as you, but like they help you walk your path by giving you perspective in the long term. So um, try to look back to when you were competing and identify for me if you had any of those pillars or if you didn't have them and how much part they played, like you can give me percentages, you can give me ratios. You can say like, they didn't matter at all. But then I'm going to ask you to describe like your, like how it is you would interact with like, for example, your cheerleaders at home or not. So then I could try to determine too, if that was the case. Mm-hmm. So when I started competing or when I started like com- before I was like a official pro or whatever, I did the whole online thing. So it was like about six months where I competed in all these online tournaments. And that's kind of how I like gained notoriety and put myself in a position to be picked up by like a top three team. Um, and this so is in League of Legends, I right? Living, Dota? Yeah. This, okay. Yeah. This is in League of Legends. Um, and I did actually compete in Dota briefly, but um, not for, not for a long time. And the prize money was almost nothing. And I never attended like a real land. So um, I didn't really consider that like, I was in esports, you know, you know, but, um, yeah, like when I was, when I started competing in league of legends, like started going to events and stuff, like, I guess my like cheerleaders, um, well, I, I guess I, I don't, I, I was going to ask you this, uh, is, it's a, can a cheerleader and a mentor be the same person? Yeah. Okay. Because I would consider, that. yeah, I would consider my, uh, my mom, a cheerleader and, a mentor like she always awesome. thought like she would always think i was like the best you know like she was always like oh yeah he's like like because she would see like i would compete and she 
learn enough about the game to like be able to tell if I was like playing well or not. And she was just like proud of my performance. So she was definitely like empowering in the fact that she would always tell me like, yeah, you're always good like on stage. You're always good in clutch moments. And it made me believe that. And it made me like feel like obligated to do that on stage, you know, mm-hmm. like, cause I wanted to, to showcase my talent or whatever. Um, and then, and then I think that she was also like a mentor in terms of like when there were like problems with my teams, things like that, or like I would have problems with my career when I got banned, things like uh, things like that. Like I would talk to her and she would explain to me um, just like her perspective, like just give that like um, that lens. Yeah, yeah, that lens that that um, like I guess some, something that who has suffered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like an older older person's uh, viewpoint on things. And I also just always like I mean, some people have different relationships with. Um, their parents but to me like my mom is somebody who i hold like really high esteem in terms of intelligence like mm-hmm. obviously everyone has, has like their problems but in terms of just like practical intelligence she's super smart to talk to but then besides for being like just conversationally smart she went to yale um undergrad she went to yale law school uh yeah she had no money and she became like uh she's now the um She's she's now actually the chair of the trust and estate and tax department at Greenberg Truck, so she has like a good position. So she pretty much like was successful and had nothing to start off, um, and she did really well acad- academically. Wow. So I always valued her like a, opinion really high because you know compared to other people, she was you know I, yeah, clearly she successful. Was just, yeah, by all yeah, metrics. Yeah, she was clearly successful. Yeah, and and you also have to take into the fact the disadvantage of like being a woman in like the workplace and to get to the point where you're and the, in the chair of the department. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 and especially like when you're talking about like 80s, 70s, 80s, like this is a yeah, much more uh, I guess sexist. A, a much yeah, m- much more sexist. This is before time the Me well, Too so. movement, you know, like <laughs> yeah. So I, I would definitely say that she was both a cheerleader and a mentor. And then another one of my like I guess cheerleaders was was my best friend Mike, who I've uh, got into the game with. Like we okay. we started the first team together, like a three versus three team, and we won actually a couple tournaments um, in three versus three when that was like the only thing that there were tournaments for. Um, and he always like, he always told me like out of all the players he played with, he thought I was the best player in the world. That's what he actually wow. believed um, based off like what we had seen. And you know, it made me, it made me believe it and it made me feel like I could just, yeah, get to the top. And I mean, those at like, I guess the peak um, like Hanover or whatever. I mean, that was the best tournament that had happened at the time we got second. So it was probably pretty close to that time. So, I, I guess that was another thing that just empowered me. I, I think I had a lot of people in my corner just believing in me, just being like, yeah, you can do it. Yeah. You can and then the you best. got the and results it, with that handover. Yeah. Like, and you're like, yeah, Oh my gosh, so like it, they're right. It could actually yeah. happen. Yeah. Yeah. It could actually happen. Like I could actually, you know, be proud. And then obviously like when Koreans started taking over, I'm like, okay, best player in the world. That's probably faker. But like, you know, I always felt like I was good at least. So didn't that, um, in that infamous video that came out, didn't they have the clip where you were just like, I am faker. Yeah, <laughs> screaming. That was actually like that was actually like like two weeks ago or like a month ago. Oh, really? Was, okay, there you go. Yeah, yeah. that's that was that was a recent clip. So it's, but, it's um, still there. You're still aiming for it. <laughs> no, I mean I was just, I was just playing it up for the stream, but it, it was a pretty sick pillar. I, I will say that I was pretty hyped off that pillar. So yeah, I mean I yeah I mean I, I just I'm easily excitable, obviously. But so that would be like cheerleader and mentor. What's the third pillar? Uh, peer, like your peer group or your journey partners. So in oh, educational research, yeah, yeah, like uh, this, this is like the largest factor for success, um, for like academic results, basically more than mm-hmm. parenting and teaching actually, uh, is the peer group. So like, if you have a good peer group, like the, the correlation with like getting into Ivy League schools and, and, and like success in the workplace and income and like social, uh, socioeconomic status, like it's just mapped to peer group more causally than like almost any other variable in terms of like academic mm-hmm. success. So of course in sport, we think like maybe this could be the case too in high performance. So I'm just curious, mm-hmm. like with your journey partners and your peer groups, like did you have relationships, uh, was it natural? Um, and what is it, what does it look like like right now or what did it look like when you were competing, I guess? Uh, also, I so as a, well, as I think I got very lucky in the in the respect that like all my teammates always like trusted me a lot and had like confidence in me. So I never had to feel like I know some some players certainly like they like I know, for example, Keith, you know, he went through times where he felt like his teammates didn't feel that he was good and that right. made him think less of himself. But I think that my teammates were all like pretty empowering or they like, you know, they would hype me up and they would or they thought I was good. 
So that would help me get through that. Like I never had to deal with any like, oh, do my teammates actually believe in me? Do they trust me? Things like that. That never was an issue. It was mainly just, um, yeah, like could we make it work as a team? So I think that I, I was pretty lucky in that respect. Like, I didn't play with anyone who was like a huge asshole or like super egotistical or was, you know, like, yeah, just talk talk down to me or anything like that. So um, in my career, at least I was I was lucky in, in that respect. So it's kind of like... Uh it wasn't necessarily like developmental, but at least it wasn't damaging in a way you didn't have, you yeah, didn't have like yeah. bad eggs and bad seeds and bad experiences that, that mm-hmm. would like, that would yeah, like trip t- up your career in a way. Mm-hmm. Okay. Definitely. Cool. Okay. So, um, the next section basically is, uh, self-diagnosis. So a lot of people wonder like how, how effective this is, but, um, there is, uh, so my, my background is in physical activity research and, uh, that's what I did my master's in. And in physical activity research, there's a big question, like if you have somebody with a pedometer on, you're measuring how far they walk, uh, and then you have them write a diary and you say, what is your physical activity for the day? There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a school of thought that says like, well, it's better to have the objective measure, right? The actual measure of how many steps they have. You have the accelerometer, you know exactly how much they moved, how much they wiggled, how much energy they expended. Turns out that a diary is actually fairly accurate. Um, so they, there's these comparison studies for like self-diagnosis or self-description versus um, versus like like objective measures. And and the question is always like what, you know, like how close are these things in terms to like true accuracy? And it turns out that there's a lot of self-diagnosed uh, like things out there in terms of measurements that are very useful and very predictable. In my experience... Mm-hmm pros so pro players who have gotten to the top and who are elite performers are quite good at saying what their strengths and weaknesses are um because in an objective thing like sport there's just no arguing with it like it's just like you just have to know that this is your weakness and this is your strength because Mm -hmm. you lose and you win there's like there's like always Mm -hmm. a metric that's telling you uh this is the this is reality this is reality this is reality this is reality and you you just have to accept it Mm -hmm. so that is why uh I go in with this, like, basically, you tell me what I should know for my job, right? Which is, what what would you put in your category as mental strengths, the things that got you to where you were as a pro, that allowed you to become pro when there's thousands, millions of people who train the same amount of hours mm-hmm. as you and never make it out of gold? And then, consequentially, or, like, not consequentially, that's the wrong word, the opposite, whatever, what are your, um, what are your weaknesses that you feel like uh, that you have either overcome or that you have overcome to the point where they're like they don't hamper you, or that still exist and and you think like do, uh, that either yeah that just like interfere with what you're trying to do. Hmm. Um. So you so the strengths first and then the weaknesses or the weaknesses first or how do you want to do it? I mean, just whatever triggers in your mind first that you want to talk okay. about. Like, so when when I when I started competing, I think the thing that gave me the advantage at least. Um, if we're talking about like actual competition and um, like on stage, I always felt like I was more willing to like go for plays than other junglers. I don't know how it is now because I feel like that this has kind of been weeded out over time. But I remember um, like when I played, there were some players that like I could tell in like a big match they just wouldn't gank. You know, they would just make the safe play every time. Like you could always kind of default to like the okay, I'm going to clear my camps and then deep ward and then go back and clear my camps. Like you can default into that mindset instead of being like okay, I think this guy is killable i'm going to like try to i'm going to do something that might be slightly inefficient in terms of pathing but i think that this play will work and like commit to the play (laughs) so i think that was probably my biggest strength as a player like i would just make shit happen at lcs where players that could be higher solo q rated than me or something like that like technically they might be like better mechanical players they just wouldn't attempt to gank as much as i would or they wouldn't attempt to make plays um, so I think would that you was see strength. these same players in scrims able to make plays, and then they would go on stage, and you would yeah, know definitely. that they wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't know that they wouldn't, but they just wouldn't. Right. Like, I wouldn't go into a game and like disrespect them and be like, "Oh, this guy just won't gank because he's like a pussy or something." You know, like I, that, that wouldn't be my mindset. But when when we played the game, like I would rewatch the the replay. You know, I'd re- rewatch all the games, and I'd be like, "Why is this guy not ganking here? Or like, why why is this guy recalling here?" Like, you could tell that their nerves were making them do things that were like overly passive. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that I was pretty decent at being like, "This is like the paths that I took in scrims that worked out. Like, these are like the ideas that I have. These are this is my my knowledge of the matchups. I'm going like, if something seems right to me, I would just do it if it seemed right, and I wouldn't 
get in my own head and be like, oh, what happens if I get counter ganked? And where, where does the basis ADC? for this ability to handle pressure on stage and, and this fearlessness, like where, where's the basis for that strength? Is it is it in your musical career or a combination of that yeah. and your parenting? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's parenting and then my musical career. Like, because that was the first time I actually got nervous before, you know? Like in, in my life, the first time that I really got nervous was when I, um, you know, had to play music in front of a lot of people, right? right. Like I had to perform a, specifically... Not when I was in groups, right? Because you, like, if you're in a group and you mess up, like in a band, it's not really super noticeable, and it's not like, oh shit, it's if your you're fault. Clarinet, but it's, it's no. one, yeah, if you're trumpet or yeah. timpani, maybe like, <laughs> yeah, may, maybe. But um, when I started having like solos, like in in high school and like the end of middle school, I started kind of being like a standout um performer in terms of music. Like that was just my thing. I cared about it more than the other kids in my school. Mm-hmm. You know, I went to like a musical like school. Um. In, in the summer, I took like a summer program at a musical school called Interlochen, which is like one of the um, it's in Michigan. It's one of the best musical schools. So that it was just like something that I really committed okay. to. And I started um, getting a lot of solos. Right. And when I had solos, you know, you're mic'd up like you, you, you have to stand up. No, number one, like everyone else is sitting down. You stand up and you're you, you know, you're mic'd up. All the tensions on you, the spotlights on you, whatever. That's like when I was first like, shit, if I fuck up, everyone is going to hear it and everyone's going to think that I'm terrible. So that was the first time I got nervous. And I think that, you know, I did have uh, like bad performances before or like performances that weren't up to like my standard. I never had like a crash and burn where I like couldn't play or I couldn't finish. But, you know, I would have, maybe I would have a squeak or I would miss a note or like, you know, the timing of it or the rhythm of it would be would be off slightly. I think having those experiences made me like comfortable playing on in, stage. In those experiences, so in the progression of you from your very first solo to like these 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 like uh this like series of solos that you're kind of describing in your history at what point did you like when does the joy come in for you so would it be like after you would finish it and you would like enjoy yeah. the feeling of doing it would it happen during the performance even at some point was it the anticipation did you enjoy that part like what for you is really the part that no, lit you uh, up? for me it was really gratifying was like when the people that like practiced with me and like knew my level like you know for example like when i was home my mom would hear me play the solo a million times um my like when i was in like band class or whatever like if i had the solo they, they, my my uh my band members and like my music teacher would hear me play it a million times right, right. my i had private lessons my private lesson teacher would hear me play it a million times it's like when i'd perform and i would exceed their expectations that made me feel good where they're like wow like you normally like were like kind of shaky at that part but you nailed it like on stage you know mm-hmm. that always was like the thing where i was like nice i like did it you know i can do it type type right. of thing um so so when when we research like things like nerves or cortisol in performance um it mm-hmm. kind of doesn't matter what the stage is it doesn't matter if it's stage for swimming or the stage for league of legends or the stage for uh you know mm-hmm like dancing right it's it's still like yeah. you're performing in front of it's it's like the idea of judgment in the mind is, is universal mm-hmm. and that's where the stress comes from so it makes sense that this would be a transferable thing that like this mm-hmm. go for it gear that you have or this like on stage fearlessness mm-hmm. would just transfer right over because you already learned the coping mechanisms and and what it is that you mm-hmm. enjoy about that process so that's really cool yeah yeah so and i guess for the for the negatives like i i there was certain champions that I never felt completely comfortable on that I would like always, I'd always find ways like to work around it. So it wouldn't be a liability for my team. But like one champion that I remember like was just hit and miss. And I never liked playing something that I thought was hit and miss. You know, if something was like hit or miss for me, I would not want to play it on stage. Um, but I, I did like play Lee on stage like a couple times, but I never liked how it felt like, especially with like how our team played, I never liked it. So I would always just kind of be like, maybe I'm not the best mechanically. I have to like, find counters to the mechanical champions um and like i need to be able to play them enough where like i can default to it but i always try to like put myself in the best position in terms of like okay if lee sin is in the meta and i don't want to play lee sin which is uh, people are gonna find this funny because i play so much lee sin on my stream now but um if, if lee sin is in the meta and i don't want to play lee sin i always wanted to, to like either bait them into picking it and just have something that I really like the other side of it. Because I don't think that in League of Legends, like there's, I mean, it's obviously there are some champions that are new, like Zoe or Kaiser or whatever that come out and they're just ridiculous. Like pe- ridiculous. Yeah. 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 But um, there was never anything like that, that for jungle. And I guess the only time that I felt like something super mechanically mechanical came into the meta that you had to play, it was Nidalee. And I just, 
I don't know. That champion just felt good for me anyway. So I guess I just got lucky in that respect. But I, I just I think that as my career got went on, I felt like I was, you know, I felt like my advantage was was definitely the the mental side of it, and I didn't think that my advantage was mechanical anymore, which is not how my career started. Like when I when I started my career against players like Saint against players like Odwin, I felt like you had this mechanical. I always advantage. felt yeah. Yeah, I felt like I had the mechanical advantage and I needed to catch up on the other stuff. I'm like, I need to know as much as they do because they've been playing longer than me and they've been competing for longer than me. So this, so, this discomfort that you had, was it, um, would you, would, I mean, how would you describe it in terms of like how it played out in terms of, in terms of like the social dynamics of the team? Was it a mental block where you were like, uh, you felt like if you would, if you accepted it, it that if you accepted that it wasn't true and you grounded out, do you feel now looking back like this wouldn't have been a problem like you would have mastered these champions and then so clearly it was like an identity issue then or do you feel no, like it was actually weird. it was true no no it was weird because my teammates had like a lot of confidence in me on mechanical champions they'd like always hype me up to play it and i would just always kind of like mask it by being like no but i always be least in with elise so just give me a lease every time and i'll just shit on the lease in anyway like yeah. i would always I always wanted to be good enough at the mechanical champions that my teammates had confidence in me having them because I never wanted to feel like I was a liability, you know? Right. I never wanted to, like, so I would play them in scrims and I would, like, pop off in scrims and I would always just try to, like, get them to the level where my teammates were like, okay, you can play that, you know? Like, if we, if we need them to play it, we can play it. But I always would also, like, subconsciously, or not subconsciously, but to, my, like, to myself, I would try to, yeah, consciously, I would try to put myself in a position where I didn't have to do something I was uncomfortable with. So even if even if my teammates thought I was comfortable, I would just be like, yeah, I would just kind of like give reasoning as to why something else is better. And I didn't I didn't think the reasoning was untrue, but I kind of like downplayed my uncomfortability. And just to be clear on my end, pick. this isn't discomfort like is it, it was was it discomfort like you didn't want to put the team on your back with a playmaker that was high risk, high reward because uh, you did no, that. You did I, that I, in I other liked, cases. You liked putting the team on your back or playmaking. Yeah, okay, sure. Yeah. It was mainly just like I didn't want to like fuck up i didn't i didn't want to like fuck up like a kick flash or something on leeson because like one of those can just lose you a game like you play something bad enough on leeson you could just lose yourself the game and i didn't like the pressure that came with um a champion that like i like champions that once you get ahead you just are ahead right like you can just play it out if you just play out the situation normally it's like comforting you just win right, right. so i lo so i love champions like you know gragas vi etc where you'd outscale like i love being on the scaling side because then if you got ahead you just win mm -hmm. whereas least it feels like you have to outplay them continuously throughout the game that's at least how i felt um, getting ahead with, means with that, that your specific. your kick flash is going to be lethal uh, and you're going to survive yeah, exactly. instead of your kick flash exactly. is going to be like you die and but you still get yeah you die yeah. instantly yeah yeah, yeah. Got it. so um, but you still got, you're still the initiator, so you got to kick flash them. Yep. Got it. Yep. Yep. That was my mentality. Okay. Um, how do you learn new skills? And so this is kind of like the final question that, that I, that I go through normally because, you know, my first sessions with players are like an hour, limited to an hour, so we just can't get into it, you know, very much more. Mm -hmm. But when I say, how do you learn new skills? I mean, you have something that you want to pick up. Do you, do, are you aware of your system? And if you're not aware of your system, what are the behaviors or habits that you think that you do that, that, that like gets you to pick up new skills? And I mean, and I don't mean like, like paltry skills. I mean like to, to the, to be able to play at the elite level, right? Like how do you bring something mm -hmm. up to, to standard as far as like what you would play on stage as a performer? Mm -hmm. Um, well, the first thing that I like, normally the way it works is you don't like come up with everything by yourself. I mean, there were definitely champion picks that I started in NA, but there was also champion picks that I didn't start in NA. And like when I would have to pick something up, like if I knew I had to get better at something, it would always be because I saw somebody else do it and I like saw the potential in it. Right. Mm -hmm. So I would try to just, um, yeah, I would just do basic things like watch, watch somebody else play. I would just like take the replay and I'd watch it from their side. Find a model. Or I would, um, yeah, I would, I would definitely find a model and do all that stuff. Like when I was in season five, one of the huge thing was LPL private streams. Not not many people abuse that, but there was private streams of every single player's perspective that played in LPL for the whole 2015 season. So Peter, who is my coach, who is also Chinese, he could get me all the private streams because like the site is impossible to navigate, you know, um, right. if you don't know Chinese. Um, and I would just watch like is this the, the is this the is this the season that he won coach of the split? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, there you go. Like that's that was yeah. his. That's why he went. Everybody was wondering why did he win coach of the split. 
Apparently he was. Uh, I mean, essentially, because we got first place. Right, we yeah. got first place in the regular season, and then whoever gets first place normally gets coach of the split. Exactly. That's like <laughs> generally how it goes. Or if you have like a really bad roster and your team overperforms, or like yeah, something like that, you know, then you get coach of the split. Like for example, with Song and Immortals, everyone thought that roster was going to be terrible, and then when they started winning, it's like okay, you get it. But um, yeah, I would watch like uh, private streams a lot. Um, and I would just like yeah, just try to figure out like what people were doing, like how they were like what their mentality was. And then I would try to like view it as, okay, you can learn something from every single player's perspective. Even if, uh, even if I thought a player was like terrible, right? Like even if there was an LCS jungler, that was like a 10 place jungler. If they were playing a pick, like I could tell if they knew something about it that I didn't. So, so I would watch a VOD of them play and I would just try to take in like every little thing that they did. Like in terms of just like, I, I would, actually like write down um what their path was like so i would just be like so how many camps did they clear and like i would think about like the jungle matchup and just try to find reasoning as to why they played it like that and then see so you if, look like, at their decisions and then you try to figure mm-hmm. out like what is the rationale behind that like what are they thinking to come up with yeah, those decisions yeah, yeah. yeah. understand yeah. their decision so, makers uh, yeah that was definitely the the first thing that i did um was uh, i would just try to get like an idea of what their mindset is and like how they played champions. And then I would just like do basic things like just watch how they comboed, et cetera. Um, see how like wary they are of certain abilities, like how they played out a fight. Um, and then I would, um, after that I would just put it into practice. I would just scrim and I would just, tr- just try to put everything that I learned, um, into like an actual situation and then see like how it looked from my team. Then I would watch myself after. So you so watch the VOD. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'll just compare what I like, how I saw my, cause then it's, it's way easier to be objective if you're watching yourself and then you watch like somebody else just played it um, as well. Like you can kind of just see like, and you didn't, the, you didn't have a double screen with like the model there and your, your own VOD. You, you had it in your mind, you had their model. Yeah. And you compared it. Well, to I would, it. I would, I actually only had one monitor. I would just have it on different tabs. I would just have it on different tabs. Like I, cause we had um, access to all of our own replays. Mm-hmm. So I would just watch mine and then I'd watch theirs and then I'd watch my, like, I, I think I did a lot more replay review than the average player because I remember even as far back as season one when like there weren't even actual replays, like there was just like VODs of tournaments. Like I was, when I was, before I was actually like on Dignitas, before I was like a real, real pro, I mean, I was like, I, I had a pro contract and I was on like the sixth best team in NA, but I wasn't a, a pro because at the time the only the top three teams went to every single event, right? right? So Back then, I'd, I was already watching replays. I was watching replays of whoever was in the finals of the tournament. So if it was Alun versus St. Vicious, I would watch their replays. And I would see what they did, how they path, like what like skills they maxed. Just like basic things like that, which a lot of people just didn't do for some reason. I don't know why. Yeah, it's not. I wouldn't say that it's common. But I, I mean, it's common for high performers. But I wouldn't say that it was common in League of Legends at all. You're right. Mm-hmm. Um. So one other question I had about your mirror, which is like when you're watching your own VOD, but before you get to the VOD part, when you actually go into the game, did you ever ever have a problem remembering what it is that you want to train? Or was it your saturation in the study of the model of this other person's play, like had so many elements of the game in your mind that when you would go into your own game, you would like remember all of the stuff that you were like trying to, to do and to like work on? Or like, did you have a system for like remembering what it is you wanted to improve on in this particular game? so that you wouldn't forget it and get to the end of the game and be like, oh, shoot, I was going to practice this thing. The only thing that I would really, like, take note of where I'd be like, okay, this is, like, what I, I want to just know is, like, the path, like, that they took, like, yep. what camps they cleared in what order. That was the only thing where I was like, okay, this is definite. And then I kind of viewed it as, like, everything after that is going to be changing based off team compositions, things like that. So and the rest the of it was just, like, change, automatic, basically. Yeah, I would just kind of just try to pick up things, you know, I'd just try to watch intensely and focus and just try to pick up on whatever I could, you know, I wouldn't be like, oh, I need to get better at this. I need to get better at that. It was just like, okay, what are they thinking? What are they doing? Like, why are they doing it? And then just trying to just see, like, if they go for a play, how they how they set it up, like, I could try to tell off the mini map. Is he like doing this? because of weight pressure like how how early is he deciding that he's gonna make, make this play like those types right, of right. things? I would just try to, um, and I would just try to like put myself in their shoes and like pause. I would pause it and then I would look at the map and I'd be like, okay, if I was here and I had this information, like what would I actually do? And I would try to think what I would actually do without before, before I would actually watch the result. So like when I, if I knew there was like a situation where it's like, okay, camps are down, I'd press space bar and I'd look at the map and I'd be like, so what, what would I do? Like, and I would think like, okay, I would pink ward the pixel brush and then I'd walk in get a deep ward on Raptors and then I would 
look top, see if there's a potential dive. If not, I would back off recall and then go bot side again. Like I would try to tell, I would try to ask myself what I would do and then see how they like played out the situation as well. During um, so this is during their replay watching their replays. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, during their replay so, watching. So this is this is a question I get a lot actually in in the Q and A show is like how do we, how do you remember mm-hmm. what to do in game? And basically this is the answer. What you're talking about is like you build a really robust mental imagery of like. Um, essentially of like what you're watching, right? You're, you're saturating yourself in all of this footage, in all this game tape of like, like the model of what you want to be or, or what you're aspiring to be or what you're, you're trying to be better than or whatever. And then, and then mm-hmm. it's like, it's inescapable in the game that your brain is dwelling on this. And also uh, forecasting is a really, really powerful tool for essentially like correcting uh, like misconceptions. So what you're describing now it makes so much sense because it's like you essentially you're forecasting the imagery and then you're like seeing if if you got it right or not. So this is something that that um, is now like spreading around in other sciences. Like for example, in sur- not in surgery, in uh, cancer diagnosis, they're trying to figure out how it is to train experts in cancer diagnosis off of X-rays. And what they found is like it's much better to have a bunch of 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 test X-rays of like cases and then have the doctor. Because like the normal way is is like okay you diagnose something, and then you wait two weeks, and then and then like a biopsy comes, and then the person cancels their appointment, and then you find out like six weeks later if you were right or wrong. So the feedback loop is really 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 big. It's too big for the brain. But your feedback loop is you you stop and you predict it, and then you get the feedback, see if you were right or wrong, if you guessed it right or wrong, like right there. So the feedback is really really close. And so that's what they're doing yeah. now is they're trying to bring forecast and then feedback like as close as they can to each other so you were like essentially mm-hmm. doing that which then that like locks something very powerful in the brain and then when you go into your own game like it's there you've learned it but like really learned it not just kind of like just watched it blank slate without any sort of like work beforehand to like get it into your head so that's cool mm-hmm. what something else you mentioned was um you would focus really hard what is your experience with flow state and focus do you know what flow state means or should i use, should i describe it or use a different word I think I know what it means, but I'd, I'd want to hear what your like the exact definition that you're using it. So like it's like being in the zone or in flow state, mm-hmm. which means it's an intense it's an intense moment of like full concentration where you feel mm-hmm. either that you like only see one thing or that you see and experience everything, but you have perfect clarity over that. And usually it's accompanied with time dilation, so like things slow down, or like mm-hmm. six hours goes by in the blink of an eye and you don't even realize it. Um, and and then also with like with like very good foreknowledge. Like for example, you can see the Nidalee spear coming and you can see yourself moving in slow motion, just like do 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 like walking so easily mm-hmm. around it that it's like it's kind of like you're at your full potential. And it comes with a hundred percent confidence and but also mm-hmm. complete um lack of judgment. Like your brain shuts off in terms of like right and wrong. You're just in it. You're just in the moment. Mm-hmm. Um well I definitely think that I was like I I guess that comes down to like being clutch or whatever i think that was always um i was always good at focusing and not letting the other stuff and like blocking things out but um yeah i'm not i'm not i'm not sure if i i I never felt like things like slowed down the only time where i felt like things actually slowed down was like that gragas e-flash that i had at madison square garden and i think that that was just because i like thought about it so hard while i was like going into the gank like i like I was thinking, like, as I came around the corner, I already was like, okay, he's going to flash. I'm going to try to predict the flash. Like, I was, I was, I'd already prepared myself for it so far in advance that it felt like, since I was waiting for that moment, I'm like, okay, I'm going to eat at him. And if he flashes, I'm like, I already had my mouse moved. And it's like, if he flashes, I'm flashing. Like, if he flashes, I'm flashing. That was just mm-hmm. my mentality. And then that felt like slow, but nothing like that ever. Like, like when I stole Barons or things like that, it never was like, it never felt slow. It was just like, all right, just go for it, you know, type of thing. Like, I would just, tell myself all i would do is i would just try to tell myself like i would give myself positive like thoughts before it like i would go into mentality with with the mentality of like i'm gonna like get this fucking baron like i would just tell myself i was gonna get it because it felt it made me feel like i was gonna get it and then i would just get it a higher percentage of the time than when i was like kind of like oh i hope i don't miss it type thing so but I never felt like, you know, skill shots or anything like came like super slow or anything like that. Like it never felt like time slowed down. It was just more like I would just try to hype myself up for it in a way. And your ability to to basically focus hard enough to ignore things. Um, basically, it's uh, the, what we know about concentration is that it's impossible to ignore things. You can't you can't choose to ignore something, but you can choose to focus 
hard enough on one thing that you don't have any attention left over for something else, which means you're ignoring it, right? So that's why, like, what ignoring is, is, like, you're so good at focusing that you can, like, not see other stuff. So that means that your focus capability or, like, your skill at focusing or your focus muscle, however you want to put it, is, like, really, really strong. Um, like, where did that come from in your self-analysis? Like, why are you volitionally able to focus very hard by choice? Um, cause this is a skill you can train it. We know that you can train to get better at it and worse at it. And we know that people that don't train it throughout their parenting and their upbringing, like don't have it. Yeah. I think that it, like a lot of it did come from like my, my parenting and my upbringing, because like, that was kind of like what, you know, when I had my first few like clutch moments or whatever, like even when I played sports, you know, my parents would tell me that I was like good at focusing. So then when I was like in the moment, I would tell myself like, like when, when I started getting thoughts of like, you know, Oh, there's like this many people watching or whatever. I would just be like, what do I have to do? Like, what do I actually have to do in game? So I would just break it down think about, steps. yeah, just break it down to like the basics of like hitting the jungle camp, like hiding in the jungle camp perfectly. Like, okay, what am I going to do after this? I'm going to drop the word. Like, what are we looking to do? And I think that another thing that helped me was just being communicative um, to my teammates. I think that that was really important because it helped me focus on the game. Like just asking people questions, like, and then hearing their feedback. It just, help me like you know really think about what i'm what i'm doing because i would have like specific questions like okay like do you think this guy worded here okay well i'm gonna drop a word and then i'm gonna back like um like or i'll be like oh this guy is like pushed out pushed out like i want to go up up here like do you think we can kill him like i'm gonna try it i'm gonna i'm gonna go for this like now that type of mentality um or that that type of like communication with my teammates just helped me yeah just like think about what I'm actually supposed to be thinking about instead of, uh, you know, kind of just like zoning out. I mean, I guess that's the thing that's different about jungle is like, I don't have a real like lane just be focusing on like super minuscule things. Like I obviously have to like kite jungle camps. Well, and, you know, be like aware of where the other jungler is, but it's not like, like I can have like a better global sense of the game than right. a laner because they're stuck so, laning. So to explicate the science behind this, like, um, essentially, what you were describing is exactly so so you would have like these these ideas okay there's people watching right whenever you were you playing soccer what sport were you playing when you're uh, baseball are you playing baseball okay cool baseball the american tennis. sport yeah 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 um at least of that generation oh man all of so this is funny because i mean it's not funny sorry i know it's a meme on your channel but you're old enough you're one of the few people i talked to that's old enough to play have played dota one back in 2004 five like i was playing dota back from 2002 to 2005 till till warcraft came out then i got sucked into warcraft but um but anyway and also to have parents who made you play baseball which is like like shortly after that generation it was like all about football Mm -hmm. and all about basketball but um that's really cool i feel like we're yeah i mean i was also i I think that it's also just like where i grew up because i was was from miami and it's like huge hispanic influence and like oh my baseball is huge in miami like all dominican republic in florida cuba yeah yeah it's absurd so it's close to all the um, Hispanic countries as well. But the other thing is the weather, um, like the weather allows you to play baseball all year round. So every team that has like training camps, they all go to every team like the, yeah, they Pirates. all have them in Florida. Yeah. All yeah. Yeah. Dodgers, everything. So, so you would, um, you, you would have this thought like, okay, uh, people are watching. Right. And then, so, but mm-hmm. this is basically a future thought. This is a, uh, judgmental thought about like a potential future right it's not even about a real future so because well obviously because there's no real future but it's about a potential future and then you would say like okay, what do i have to do and that's bra- dragging your brain back to the present moment and the other tools that we use to do this in mindfulness training are breath and communication right because you could only ever have a conversation in the present moment like it's impossible to have a conversation with somebody uh if you're really engaged in the conversation if i'm focusing on what you're saying and listening that's not in the past or the future. Like, it's only now. So if you're communicating with teammates, that's one of the, like, surefire ways that, like, for example, I train other teams to get themselves out of the past and the stupid mistake they just made or whatever and back into the present and, like, focusing on the game. So these yeah, are two, like, like really next? concrete tools that you would use to get, like, that present moment focus. And what we know about focus is, like, it's a, it's like a pie, right? Like a, you could say mm-hmm. almost like a whole pie. And so if you have, a, like, 40% of it focused on some past event or worry or frustration about the future or like what Reddit's going to say, then that's like, Mm -hmm. you only have 60% of focus for your actual execution. And let's say the other jungler or player is at like 90% focus. It doesn't matter if they're worse than you. If they're Mm -hmm. more present, then they're probably going to execute better. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. That's really, 
that's really interesting. And the other thing you mentioned there along the lines that I heard was like self-talk, where you said you would self-talk yourself in terms of positive psychology. Um, I'm curious as to whether there's other self-talk that's not just like blind positive psychology. Like, I can do it, I can do it. But like other mantras that you have used in your entertainment career, your business career, or your streaming career that have allowed you to like um, push through when your motivation wasn't there, just in terms of like discipline and in helping you make decisions. Mm. I mean, I, I think for, for the business side of things, it's more just like thinking about like what you've worked for and like just understanding how streaming does snowball, right? Like to get to the point where I was making, well, however much a month um, that I'm making now, like to get to that point, I needed to uh, like put in work, right? And every day you don't stream, you lose subs. Every, every time you like have a bad stream, you probably like lose viewers. So I'll just kind of view it as like, I need to keep this going if I want to like, you know, so your self talk is about like the, the like the long term commitment and the value of like the the grind essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's essentially, just all about okay. the the grind. It's like I've grinded so hard to get here. That's why I don't take many days off. You know, like earlier this year, I did sixty five days straight. I didn't take a day off in sixty five days because I I knew that it's like if I do take like a day off, it kind of snowballs. You know, like that that's how I am at least. I'll take a day off oh. and I'll be like, wow, I got to do all this stuff that I want to do. You know. And it's like fun, you know, and you're like, oh, wow, I wish I had like another day I could do that. And then the next day, it's like harder to turn on the stream. And after a while, it's just like you're you're not even streaming anymore. That's how you end up in like a three week break like Tyler one where you try to get challenger for like for like a month straight. It's just it just feels good after a while to like, oh, I don't have any commitments. I don't have to do anything. So I try to like keep myself away from that <coughs> because I, I know how I respond to it. Like I respond very like, like yeah, I mean, I enjoy like that, that thing. And I think that that was kind of what was good um, about the pro life is you do have like, you know, you have like at least like a break, you know, every now and then like where it's like, oh, you might have, I mean, let's say you go to worlds or something, maybe it's less, maybe it's only like 10 days or something. But, um, like we never, like normally our seasons, we would end in like September and we wouldn't have to like start scrimming again until like mid November, you know? So we actually did have a break where I could do what I wanted, you know? And that seasonal, um, that seasonality of like life is actually really, I think in sport really healthy because you can go like a hundred percent all in, and then you can go a hundred percent all out. Do you try to mimic that in your, like your approach to streaming a business as well, or are you just um, like a hundred percent all in, and you're just gonna be like, this is my next seven years, and I'll go all out like when I, yeah, when I'm done with that. That's or? pretty much how it is. I mean, it's essentially the way. I, what happened is I just started like making enough money where I was like, wow, if I like do this for like seven, eight years. I'll li literally be able to live off the like returns of my money in the, in the market, you know? So I'm just at this point, I'm just like, okay, even if I feel like not doing something, like I'm just going to grind it for right now because I can set like everything up with this, yeah. you know, like this is, this, is, this can, and the value of overrides any this. sort of like meandering emotion of the day and stuff like that. that yeah, like, exactly. Like, exactly. Like guiding star. Okay, cool. Yeah. The, va the value of, uh, being able to, to make my, and, and it's also just like the fear of, um, you know, the uncertainty of, you know, I, I don't have a college degree. Like, right, you left college the, for this life, yeah. Yeah, I, I left college for this life. And if I do, if I ever was just completely out of esports and I had to start over, like, where I was in college, you know, I'm super far behind, you know, I'm seven, eight years behind where I so, so would have been. So the positive thing is that um, I'm not really sure that this is backed up by research, but it, it's certainly backed up by anecdotal experience. Um both, both with myself and other like high performance trainers in sport, that elite performers often, um, so so they miss out on a lot of the different experiences of their peer group, right? If you look at the like the people who are just like kind of in standard lives, or just people who veer off into like elite performance lives, um, mm -hmm. it, it's very different paths. And the 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 interesting thing is that oftentimes when the person like leaves sport or like through injury or through like retirement or whatever and goes back and like mm -hmm. goes into the same life like they, f they feel like they're behind right because they've lost all these experiences but actually mm -hmm. socially and emotionally um and in terms of like the skills that dictate success in a lot of things like business and relationships mm -hmm. um they're often very very far ahead of their peers and the reason is because elite performance and like you know, intense business, like for example, what you're doing on Twitch where it's pure entertainment, um, you know, mm -hmm. eight hours a day is um, a rugged environment. It's a rugged environment that tests you on a daily basis. So if you think about how many times uh, an average like 
person who went stayed in college, for example, would be told they are insufficient. They're an insufficient human at this moment for the task at hand. It's like maybe a couple mm-hmm. times a year, a couple times a month, mm-hmm. like maybe once a semester, you know? But like mm-hmm. in, in League of Legends or in sport, you can be told six times a day or like even within those games, within those scrims, you can be told every five minutes that like you are insufficient. You are not up to this task. And, and it's like you're faced with this reality of who you are over and over and over again. And you just, you have two choices. You break or you accept it. And that acceptance comes with like a very powerful kind of developmental freedom. And so what we see is the like, insane development that happens with, with elite performers that like puts you so far ahead of the average population that you catch up very swiftly uh, when, you, when you rejoin and then you overtake them like rapidly. So I would say, I mean, you should be afraid of it, right? Because it's a driver. It sounds like it's motivating you and it's very powerful. But I would mm-hmm. say like you shouldn't fear it too much because your skill set in terms of transferable skills is up to the task of whatever it is that you would tackle after this for sure. Yep. Um, I probably could Hopefully. have DM'd that to you instead of like saying it on stream. But anyway, I wanted to tell everybody yeah, in the audience fine. as well so that they understand what's going on here. But, <laughs> yeah, okay. for all the elite performers in the, <laughs> exactly. in the audience, they can apply uh, it to themselves. That that's That's it. That's my first session. That's what we go through. So... Um, what were, Sounds what were good. some of the things that did you realize or, or understand anything, uh, while you were going through this or was it all you're um, like, Oh, like, oh, yeah, it's just me. So I already know all these things. No, I just, I just didn't know, like, um, I guess how relevant the people around me were to act to my actual success. You know, like, I think that that's actually a big thing that people overlook is just the environment that they're in and things like that. Like, I don't think that I would have been a good player like at LCS if, you know, I didn't have if, if I like actually felt like shit about myself, you know, and I think the fact that I was like with people that always had kind of like like Steve always had confidence like the, from the owner, like he, like Mark, for example, uh, Mark Z, he was the analyst for last year's and he like, you know, he, he would he, he thought I was a beast. Right. And he would tell me I was a beast. So like I would feel like obligated to perform well, where I feel like if you were in a different situation where people think you're shit, it's probably way easier to just like yeah just play differently on stage like not be able to play to your fullest and just kind of like try to not fuck up like that that becomes your mentality so in a, yeah, definitely. In a way it's gated on your own ambition so there are people that their own self-ambition is so overwhelmingly powerful that like nothing else can dent that nobody's opinion of how good or bad they are can touch it because their their level of ambition is literally so high it's like it surrounds them in a bubble uh, mm-hmm. which actually means, yeah, I don't think I was like that means that they aren't also they are so, aren't also motivated by people who are up talking them as well right like that's impervious mm-hmm. to them because like it's mm-hmm. it's so self-centered um, so that's the case but but otherwise like it's very 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 important I think in th- this is actually um, I think a new I don't want to say a new field of research but I was reading some new articles on it that, that make me think that like maybe su- support network research is like booming again because um uh, i was looking at uh uh what's it called growth through through stress so stress related growth that's what it was stress related growth s r g um and uh and in stress related growth they 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 were developing a model so it was new research right this is a, this is a new research where it's like typically uh anxiety is seen as a bad thing um, but we know in, in sport that anxiety is actually a developmental factor. That it's like a good thing. That anxiety helps us grow faster and better than other people. So how could it be a bad thing mm-hmm. all the time? Right? Maybe high anxiety is bad, but like normal anxiety, without that, there's no growth. Or at least I think there's no growth. Mm-hmm. This is a personal opinion. But there are people who are trying to mm-hmm. prove it. Anxiety-related growth. That like it's a good thing. And in the model, what they found um, when they were when they were testing the model was that support. W- so the support network was so important that it ended up being the the most and the only causal factor to determine whether or not whether or not people achieved growth through anxiety through a stressful moment or did not achieve mm-hmm. growth. It was like the one kind of factor that mediated it one way or the other. Mm-hmm. So I would say like it could be, and this isn't proven yet, obviously, because there was only like two studies on this when I when I last checked, but it could be in the future that it's like really clear that support network is or or your support Mm -hmm. structure is like the defining factor of success as you and so the more stress you can handle and put through your support network the better and faster you grow yep okay sounds thanks um i'm gonna hit stop recording now